Knowing where the virus is and how it's spreading is essential to being able to stop this pandemic. That might mean needing fairly granular information in order to get resources to where they're most needed. Do we have that? Let's ask. All in the provincial capital tonight, Dr. Adam Kassim. He is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist at Runnymede Healthcare Center. Laura Rosella, associate professor in the epidemiology program at the U of T's Dalalana School of Public Health. And Sane Dubé, policy and government relations lead at the Alliance for Healthier Communities with a focus on black health. And we are delighted to welcome you three to our broadcast tonight and to my attic, I guess, virtually. Uh, Adam, let's go first uh, with you. As you look at the data, what jumps out at you at the way COVID-19 is distributed at the moment throughout the population of Ontario? Thanks for having me, Stephen. It's really a pleasure to be here on the agenda. I, you know, it's interesting when you look at the data. Uh, what we find with COVID especially, first of all, we know that it's a very uh, contagious virus, which is why all of the measures that are being put in place uh, are so important, right? And so we know that it is contagious amongst a variety of different populations. And, you know, across Ontario and certainly across the country, what we're finding is that um, cases are clustered based on different types of uh, epidemiological uh, bands. And so what I mean by that, for example, is across Canada, for example, uh, about 30% of all cases come for or come in the band of 30 to 50, sorry, 40 to 60 uh, years of age. 55% uh, of all um, cases are actually female. And so there are certain clusters that we're able to identify based on the data that's actually being uh, collected at the moment. Uh, and, you know, one of the one of the biggest concerns is whether or not we're actually collecting uh, enough data and enough different data points on different subsets of different populations. And I imagine that uh, this is sort of a conversation that will be an ongoing one during um, during this program. Absolutely. We're certainly going to explore that over the next half hour or so. Laura, uh, we're also going to chat about the social determinants of health, and I don't want to assume that everybody knows what that means. So give us the uh, dictionary definition 101 of uh, social determinants of health. Right. So the social determinants of health include factors uh, like demographic factors, sex, uh, uh, so age, some of which you've heard, also things like race, ethnicity, um, and also economic factors, income, education, and uh, living conditions, occupation. Uh, those are the types of information that fundamentally are about a person, about how they live, and the environments in which they live. And we know why that's important for health in general, but for COVID-19 in particular, why is all that important? Well, we know that the social determinants of health affect pretty much every disease, uh, risk of getting the disease and the outcomes once individuals are sick with the disease. And that uh, includes in infectious and non-infectious diseases. Actually, I was trying to think about an infectious disease that is not influenced by the social determinants of health, and I couldn't. Um, so we have lots of respiratory diseases, influenza, and even COVID-19 with data from around the world that we know is influenced by those factors I just mentioned. Either risk of infection is higher or the risk of serious complications such as hospitalization and deaths differ by these different factors. Hmm. Now, Sana, let me get you to sort of um, mm -hmm. start us off on a bit of a pre-pandemic and post pan or not post, I guess, in the midst of the pandemic uh, comparison. Prior to COVID-19, what sort of health inequity existed in Ontario as it relates to the social determinants of health? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think I would echo what Laura said, uh, just the social determinants of health really tell us a lot about the way that a person lives and the way that they die um, and the health uh, issues that how their health turns out, basically, uh, depending on, on what their determinants of health are. So we know that in Ontario, um, equitable health is not something we've ever had in this province, uh, and there are many reasons for that. There's a long history of uh, colonization in Canada uh, for Black folks, legacies of being enslaved on this land um, and we know that there's a structural and systemic issues that impact access to health. So uh, good health is really about uh, having access to, to resources um, to, to being able to access health. Um, and for many people, that, that was not the case even before COVID. Um, so I come from the community health sector, uh, where we work with folks who are marginalized and folks who, who we know have not had uh, good access to health even before COVID. And we would say that what COVID has done is that it, it, it hasn't flattened those inequalities. On the contrary, it's actually um, uh, made the disparities more stark. 
Um, and so we see uh, much more difference in terms of, of health access under COVID. Well, some argue that that should lead us to keep uh, not just basic information about who's contracting this disease, but much more uh, intensive demographic information. Uh, some have argued we need to keep race-based race -based statistics on who gets this. Mm -hmm. And this was a question that was put to the province's chief medical officer of health, Dr. David Williams, uh, a couple of weeks ago about whether the province thought it ought to start collecting or whether it had collected race-based statistics on COVID-19. We want to play a short clip of what he had to say, and then we'll come back and chat. So let me ask Chad Castle, who is directing today. Chad, if you would, let's roll that clip. In Canada, we, we don't collect uh, race-designated uh, cases unless there are certain risk factors and groups and areas of that level uh, in that. Uh, worldwide, we haven't had any further data from the WHO or from other sectors about any specific ones in particular. We will be advised by that as they come forward with various information and epidemiological evidence. Right now, we consider our main risk groups are the elderly, uh, those with other comorbidities, regardless of what race they are, as well as other health conditions that would reduce their immune status. So those are all priorities to us, regardless of race, ethnic, or other backgrounds. They're all equally important to us. Now, I'm sure this is not the first time that all three of you have heard that comment. So I'd like to know, put yourself back in the, in the headspace you were at two weeks ago when you heard Dr. Williams say that for the first time. And Adam, start us off. What was your reaction when you heard him say it? I was actually quite shocked, Steve, about sort of the posture that Dr. Williams used as far as uh, his justification for not collecting race-based data. I think at that time, it might not have been a WHO recommendation, but what we're finding, of course, throughout this pandemic is that uh, criticism of the WHO as far as its, um, its leadership, uh, you know, has been uh, under question. And I think that uh, at that same time, what was also important was that the United States, which you know many of us uh, here in Canada believe um, have had a very difficult time with 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 the pandemic as far as its uh, its 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 um, response, they've been collecting race based data uh, for COVID patients for for a while now, and which is why that they have which is why they have statistics that show uh, Black and Latino communities being at a higher risk of death from COVID. We just simply don't have that data here. And I think the, uh, the, the justification for it not being necessary is a, is a very porous one indeed. I think that um, you know, this is sort of a legacy of how I think public health units that maybe provin provincially and perhaps you know, broadly speaking across the country have, um, have, have, sort of sh have, have shared data. I think what's telling is that uh, local public health units, so specifically Toronto, Peel, and York region have all indicated their desire and now uh, infrastructure that's gonna be related to it to collect race basically in these jurisdictions. So it's interesting that there's a disparity at the local level compared to the provincial level. Hmm. Laura, what did you think when you first heard Dr. Williams say that? I think I would agree. At that time, we did know that these disparities very likely did exist. We were seeing the evidence coming from the US and not only that, we know from our province in similar outbreaks, including H1N1 pandemic, that we also saw these disparities. We know that the risk factors such as, uh, you know, being an essential worker, the ability to physically distance more densely populated uh, cities and homes, and, you know, the need to use public transit are all factors that uh, can differ across uh, race and ethnicity, um, among a bunch of other factors. So uh, I don't think that there's a rationale for not collecting this data based on risk of infection, uh, nor uh, risk of severe outcomes. I, I do know that social determinants of health and equity are at the core of public health. So I know that that's really important to provincial and local public health. And uh, it's, it's unclear why it was uh, stated in that particular way. I can't speak to the specific motivations. It, it just goes against to what we knew at the time about the epidemiology of the disease and what we know generally about how infectious diseases, especially emerging infectious diseases spread in Ontario. Well, Senna, let me, let, let me make the argument that I suspect Dr. Williams would give. Let me draw this inference mm -hmm. and then get your response. L mm -hmm. Let's assume that he wasn't trying to be racist when he said it. Let's assume that he was trying to say, we don't discriminate against anybody in this province. We want to treat everybody equally, and therefore we don't collect race-based data because we don't want to be accused of uh, marginalizing or 
um, stigmatizing any community in particular. Now, I'm not saying you drew that inference, mm -hmm. but it could be that that's mm -hmm. what he was trying to say. If he was, mm -hmm. what's your reaction? So my reaction to that would be that assumes that we all started at the same point. That assumes that, uh, say, if we're running a race, all of us started at the same starting point, which we didn't. Um, we, you cannot say that everyone is treated equally because we know that that's not the truth. Um, and uh, the the goal of, of collecting this data is to, to hold our health system accountable um, and to fix where the disparities are. Uh, we can't fix what we can't measure. So for us to, we, we can't say that everyone is treated equally if we don't know, we haven't measured it. We cannot see where the disparities are. So I think I would echo what everyone else said that it was really, uh, to be frank, an appalling moment um, and a disappointing moment. It really felt like uh, a moment for, for missed uh, leadership um, in this pandemic. One thing that, uh, as, as Adam and Laura said, uh, people have been calling for this data for a long time. And this is not something that's new under COVID. COVID has, has simply made it evident that it's something that we have to, to do to, to, to be able to, to respond to this crisis in a good way. So I think that I would say that um, that assumes that uh, there are no in inequities um, in Ontario, which we know is not true. Uh, racialized people, uh, black folks, indigenous folks, uh, folks who uh, belong to the LGBTQ community, all these people don't access health in the same way um, as their counterparts. Um, so we cannot say that everyone is treated equally. It's untrue. Adam, I know that when he said it, I happened to be live tweeting that news conference when he said it, and I put out his quote on Twitter. And I'll tell you, it's been a long time since I saw the explosive reaction that that comment got. It sounded like, and in some respects, we were sort of back in the middle of the, you know, Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter debate. But could, could, would you agree that Dr. Williams wasn't trying to be racist? He just may have not phrased as elegantly as he ought to have what the provincial policy is. You want to go there? Sure, Stephen. It's funny because actually the reason how, the way I actually came to know about the quote was actually through your uh, social media tweets. So I appreciate your uh, journalistic uh, integrity there. Uh, you know, I, I actually don't believe perhaps that, that Dr. Williams is racist or um, means to be. I think that what it is a demonstration of perhaps is his blind spots about how racialized communities uh, in our province uh, experience uh, health care and, and the access to health care. I think that, you know, this this goes beyond the pandemic, right? See, this goes beyond uh, COVID. It, it it filters into other aspects of, of healthcare. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So as a South Asian, um, you know, our communities actually experience heart disease in a much different way. And uh, what that means is that our um, screening protocols actually need to be adjusted based on our um, our race. And the only reason we know that is because there were actually intentional studies to look at different types of people across the world. Um, similarly, and Sine probably knows a, a lot about this as well, uh, from the black community perspective, which is um, African American and, and black women actually experience breast disease much differently than um, other other women. And so again, there are screening protocols are actually adjusted based on this. And so there's actual medical rationale uh, and, and it has, has an effect on the way that uh, individuals are treated. So not only is it a, you know, perhaps an academic discussion, it's an actual, uh, it has a significant impact at a, at a population health level. Laura, presumably part of what Dr. Williams was trying to do though, and I haven't talked to him about it, so I don't know, I'm again drawing inferences here, but presumably he was trying to say, we want to get information, but we also want to respect people's privacy as well. Would you agree there's a, that there is a tension here between, between trying to get as much granular, particular, specific demographic information as possible, while at the same time respecting people's privacy? Is, is that an issue here? It, it is a good point, and it's perhaps one of the reasons why we haven't been able to make as much progress in this area in Canada generally than we would have liked. Collecting this data is not without risk. We have to acknowledge that. There are always uh, the potential for stigma, um, that the data is not going to be used uh, properly, um, and who uses the data and for what purpose. Those are really important questions that we need to always be asking. Uh, we need to ensure there are safeguards in place, strong governance, trust, community engagement. All of those factors uh, need to be in place to make sure this data is collected responsibly. It is possible that that was a contributing factor um, for the decision not to proceed with this data. 
But I, I will echo that we have collected this data in the past. We collected this type of data during H1N1. We did show there were disparities in the social determinants of health, and it was important in understanding the response. So, of course, it's a balance, but I, I do think there's a nuance here that, that recognizes that the way, the way we collect this data, how we collect it, how we use it does need to be respected um, and done very responsibly. Well, Sandy, I guess we could say that, um, you know, there's a couple of other jurisdictions that, that seem to be on top of this already. Toronto Public Health, I think Peel Region Public Health are both collecting race-based statistics. And I wonder as well, you know, the province of Ontario has now said they're going to collect stats by postal code. Does that mm -hmm. essentially achieve the same thing in your view? Mm -hmm. So uh, before I answer that, I'm just going to push back, Steve, a little bit on the uh, the question that you asked around, um, is it racist uh, for Dave Williams to ask us? I think that this is a distraction, um, and I think that it, it takes away uh, from very important work that needs to, to happen for us to, to spend a lot of time talking about was something uh, racist or problematic when the communities that are impacted are already saying that we, 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 we understand that there are issues here. So as Laura said, we collected this data during H1N1. We found that during that time, Black folks, for example, were 10 times uh, more likely to face uh, harms uh, from, from that pandemic. Uh, so I think that, uh, I, and I, I really appreciate the work that the media does uh, with uh, raising these issues, but I do think that the time, we're past the time to be asking is it racist and more we should be focusing on uh, what communities are saying and seeing on the ground. Um, in regards to postal code, um, I do think postal code is a very useful uh, measure. Uh, it tells us a lot about what is happening in communities. Um, and I think it is something that uh, many jurisdictions in our province and across the country collect. It tells us a lot about the socioeconomic status um, of populations. However, uh, it, there, there are real risks in conflating postal code data with racial, uh, with race-based data. So, for example, we know that someone can live in the same postal code and have vastly different experiences. Uh, my colleague Jane Reyna, who's a researcher, always talks about the analogy of uh, people who are in the same postal code, but there's mansions and there's rooming houses. So we're both in the same postal code, but we experience life really differently. Um, and what we've also found in studies is that uh, postal code doesn't account for all the disparities that people feel or uh, that people experience. So someone can be living in the same area, earning the same income, but their access to healthcare is differential. And often that uh, race is, is a major determinant that impacts um, how people access healthcare. So I think that absolutely, let's collect the postal code data but um, there are real risks with conflating or expecting it to uh, replace race-based data. And then I think if the, the, the other issue is that um, if postal code is seen to, to, to be the replacement for race-based data, it once again does that work of invisibilizing um, inequities, uh, which is what uh, many people in the sector are pushing back against. We need to make these inequities visible so that we can address them. Adam, let me ask what uh, is not intended to be a naive sounding question, but I suspect there will be people watching right now who want this question answered. If there are, for example, two different families that live in the same postal code, have the same income, one family is white, one family is black, why would their access to a single payer, supposedly equitable healthcare system be any different? So that's a very interesting question, Steve. Uh, in theory, we should all have equal access in our public health care system, but we know that's simply just not the tr just not the facts. Uh, you know, right now you could live in a postal code um, and be neighbors, but if one family has uh, a personal relationship with a doctor or a healthcare system, um, they might be able to jump the queue a uh, bit more significantly than, than, than another person. And so I think that we like to have a foundation of, uh, of what we think is an equitable healthcare system delivery system. But the fact of the matter is, is that it, that's just simply not the case. I think just going back to what you had alluded to earlier, which was that York, Peel and Toronto um, public health units have decided now to uh, initiate the collection of this data. I think it's important to recognize that, first of all, this data is not necessarily hard to collect. Uh, and we can often uh, have sort of opt-in programs where, p where patients uh, who, whose data is, is being collected, first of all, has to go through a, a personal consent process. And so having their consent to do this is an extremely important point. But the other point I wanted to make was that all of those three public health units, uh, their chief uh, public health officer uh, are, all race are all racialized uh, in these three jurisdictions, which I find to be very interesting 
Uh, and so it kind of, I think, identifies how important certain populations and certain groups of people feel about this situation compared to others. Okay, I do need to get you to follow up on that. When you say that all the medical officers of health in those outlying regions are racialized, hmm. they are what, as opposed to Dr. David Williams, who is uh, obviously a, a white man of a certain age? So there's, um, I think, Peel region. Uh, it's uh, the the public health officer is uh, is an East Asian. Uh, I'm a doctor uh, Eileen Devilla, of course, uh, is Asian, and in the York region, uh, it's Dr. Kurji, who I believe is a South Asian uh, member of, of 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 the community. And so I think that uh, I believe that they have recognized, given the communities that they serve, whether it's in Peel or York or in Toronto, where there are, are significant numbers of visible minorities. They've identified that this is a, uh, an important issue to uh, to pursue. So I think that that just uh, is a curiosity of mine that I've, I've noticed that uh, has developed over the past several weeks. Uh, OK, Laura, I should get you to follow up on that. Do you, do you think the fact that that the um, medical officers of health in some of those outer regions um, are from more diverse backgrounds than Dr. Williams makes a difference in the way they do their jobs? Well, certainly, I think that people's background uh, offer a lens to an issue and uh, how people are raised and what they've experienced. Um, and I actually think it's really important to have leadership that represents what our community looks like. So they definitely bring this forward. I also think they bring forward a strong training in public health, which at its core, recognizing that uh, we want to reduce health inequities and we want to make sure that when there's disparities in the population, we're just we're addressing them. And it starts for the most part with measurement. Um, so I think that both those factors are being uh, brought forward in the leadership that they're taking in this in this position. OK, Laura, let me uh, you, while you have the floor, I want to circle back to something that I think Adam or maybe it was you who said, uh, I mean, a good uh, 15 minutes back, which is and. Uh, you know, we need some understanding of why this would be. Uh, I think it's north of 55%, you said, of those who've contracted COVID-1 are female. Why would right. that be the case? Right, so there's a few hypotheses, but they, again, without the detailed information, we can't draw uh, absolute conclusions. But one of the important ones is that 14% of the positive cases are actually healthcare workers. And we do know that there are gender differences in healthcare workers and essential workers in these provinces, um, and that there are more women. So that is one prevailing reason why probably more women are, are tested positive. Um, it would be good to know, again, with occupation breakdown and some of the other factors, if there are other um, explanations for this, but that's probably the most important in Ontario at the moment. And yet, Adam, apparently, if you look at the statistics overseas in countries such as Italy or China, it is men who are much more likely to die of COVID-19 than women. Why would that be? So we actually don't have a good handle on this. There are a couple of interesting theories, uh, one specifically out of uh, Oxford University, which suggests that um, uh, uh, when, uh, the way that our body senses uh, the presence of a coronavirus is through certain proteins that are made by the immune system. And it's believed that some of those proteins are actually encoded for on the X chromosome. And of course, women have two X chromosomes and, and men have one. So the thought is, is that uh, the amplification of having two uh, chromosomes allows for a better immune response in women compared to men. Uh, the other possible idea behind this is that there are certain behavior profiles that are different, uh, generally speaking, amongst men and women. So men tend to smoke more. Um, and, and have uh, higher rates of certain chronic diseases. And so that's probably a combination of reasons why men are perhaps at a higher risk of not only having a more severe version of the disease, but needing a hospitalization, ne needing an ICU admission, and perhaps even intubation, and unfortunately dying from the disease. Adam, I'm freelancing here, so shut, shut me down if you think this is ridiculous, but it, could it also be a factor that men tend to act more recklessly than women? They tend to think that they're more invulnerable than women, they therefore aren't as careful in their behavior as women and therefore are more likely to engage in behaviors that can get them killed in this? I, I think that that's certainly part of the puzzle that we're, we're seeing around the world. And, and, and some of the things that you've said are probably more anecdotal as opposed to studied. But again, it comes back to making sure that we're studying this in the proper way. But I, I would tend to agree with you. Sane, help us out on this angle of the story. It, tell us why it's important to know with, with really deep dive demographic information, 
why it's important to know uh, the gender, uh, the race, the socioeconomic status. Why is it important to know all of this information about people who either contract the virus or eventually succumb to it? Mm -hmm. So I think, Steve, the quick answer to that would be data helps us to identify the pathways um, to providing good care. So if we know what age people are, if we know what uh, socioeconomic bracket they occupy, if we know um, what type of jobs um, the people who are, 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 are contracting the virus are in, um, then we can intervene in those places to provide protections for people, right? So if we're seeing a high number of healthcare workers who um, are contracting the virus, then the intervention is things like uh, personal protective equipment and other infection and prevention controls in, in hospitals. So really the data, I would say it, it, it illuminates where we need to go, what we need to be doing, where we can remove risks um, and where we can add protective factors for people. Uh, I, I think of data really as a, a guiding uh, a point for all those things. I think that uh, collecting the data also allows us to, to make decisions about healthcare spending. Um, so uh, resources are finite. No health system has infinite amount of money. Um, we have to make decisions, and often those are hard decisions about where we spend money, what type of programs we invest in. And having data allows us to make those decisions with evidence. Um, so it's not just something that is anecdotal. It's not something Thing that um, is depending on who is sitting at that table at that time. Uh, it, it allows us to make those decisions with the best information that we have in front of us. And Sana, let me follow up with this. I, do I have this right mm -hmm. that you are part of a group that wrote a letter to the Health Minister of Ontario, Christine Elliott, not too long ago, saying mm -hmm. you really need to expand your testing beyond the priority groups that you have identified? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yes. So if so, what groups are, are you most particularly concerned are falling through the cracks at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. So we've been really concerned, Steve, uh, with uh, folks who are marginalized. Um, on Friday last week, the province uh, released what they call the action plan to help vulnerable populations, which is really great. Um, it's a very detailed plan that expands beyond uh, focus in lynch intervention and long-term uh, care facilities to also look at uh, places like shelters for people who are experiencing homelessness and folks who live in group homes. Um, all of those populations are really important. Uh, but we would say that there are still gaps in the testing that's available. So for example, we know that in shelters, um, even though we've had outbreaks in shelters, there isn't necessarily widespread testing of people who even are don't have symptoms. Um, and we do know that uh, some folks will not have symptoms and still be passing the virus um, or still get sick. Uh, so we have been calling for testing in these high risk uh, areas. So in places like shelters, in other group living facilities, in prisons and detention centers, we know that not enough testing is being done. Um, and the conditions in all of those facilities make practicing things like social distancing, um, isolation very difficult, if not impossible. Um, so we've argued that there, there, there are real places where people are being left behind. Even when you look at uh, shelters for uh, women who are experiencing, women and gender diverse people experiencing gender-based violence, um, many of those people are in shelters where they're living in group settings Again, not enough testing is happening there, um, and uh, people are really at increased risk. Laura, as we know, long-term care facilities have really been ground zero in this war against the pandemic. Uh, the, the, the most and hardest hit people have been in long-term care facilities. What would demographic data be able to tell us about what we ought to be doing there? Right. So uh, we know that age is an important risk factor, and that's a contributing factor to why long-term care homes are affected, but we don't know anything more about the residents. We don't know if certain residents in certain types of homes are more at risk. And we also don't know anything about the demographic breakdown of the healthcare workers that are working at the long-term care homes and the support staff um, who are likely important contributors um, and also at risk themselves. So without this information, again, the control strategies that we're putting in place are very blunt at the moment, You know, minimize the number of people in and out uh, infection control procedures, but we can't nuance that in any way to, as we know, certain homes are more at risk than others. Um, and we can't risk stratify residents in those homes in any uh, way further aside from age and, and gender. Okay, we've got about five minutes left here. And Adam, let me try this with you. Um, I don't want to get, as the expression goes, too far out over my skis here, but the most recent data that we have 
on the modeling suggests that the virus may have hit its peak in the province of Ontario. So I'd like to find out from you, you know, obviously it very much depends on our continuing to do all of the protocols that we've been urged to do, wash hands, physical distance, and so on. Uh, so again, we're not out of the woods, but but certainly the, the last few days, the incoming data has been uh, quite encouraging. How important is it still, therefore, to get the kind of dem demographic data that we've been talking about on this program? So I think it's still very important. I think it's been important since day one, and it'll continue to be important. I think part of the uh, corollary to that is uh, we expect second and third waves, perhaps, until we have a vaccine and, and appropriate treatments. And so we're certainly not out of the woods yet, and we're probably in early innings of this ball game. I think we're probably in the second or third inning. So while the data looks very good right now, and we are seeing perhaps a flattening of the curve, we also have to recognize that this is a this represents a lag from two weeks ago. And so once again, as you kind of alluded to, we still need to keep our foot in the gas and and do the right things. Uh, but collecting the data shouldn't be, I think, a debate. It should be just let's get it done. It's not a hard thing to do. We can get consent and it will provide a, a, another window into how this disease is affecting uh, our communities, because really we, we are still learning uh, on the fly here. Yeah, Laura, could you follow up also from from a point of view of in the late fall, early winter, we're not only going to be fighting coronavirus, but the typical seasonal flu as well. It's going to be a double whammy, presumably. And again, how important would it be to have really deep dive data at that point? So I'm going to argue that I think it's even more important. So the second waves that we've seen in other countries actually show a disproportionate burden among certain subpopulations. So we have this first wave that sort of touches all aspects of the population, even though there are disparities. And then you see a second wave that's especially concentrated in vulnerable populations. So Singapore is a, a, an example of a population that was really applauded for its response. They you know, were able to trace and contact and test widely. And they've had a fairly significant second wave concentrated among foreign workers who live in congregate setting. And again, without understanding the demographics of the population and who's getting sick, we can actually have these fairly large and significant second waves and uh, completely wider inequities than we saw the first time. Um, so I would argue that it's even more important to collect this information going forward. It's going to be uh, certain groups that are even more vulnerable to the second wave than the first wave. And if we don't have an eye on it, we're, we're just going to mismatch our policy response to, to the second wave. And, and it's the same for influenza. We know these disparities already exist for seasonal influenza, um, which again may amplify the issue if both these viruses are circulating together. In which case, Sana, in our last uh, minute and change here, tell us uh, if in fact we get the kind of uh, granular information and data that all three of you are urging, what kinds of policy changes uh, would you like to see coming out of uh, both the federal and provincial, and I guess all three, federal, provincial and municipal uh, health officials accordingly? So I think that, again, Steve, it goes back to uh, directing resources uh, to communities that are being left behind. Um, so once we have that data, we can better identify where the gaps in care are um, and where we are leaving people behind. So I think that I would like to see coming out of this a healthcare system that is able to better support people across the board. Um, your health access should not be differential dependent on where you live or what race you are or what your socioeconomic status is um, that is uh, that's something that we should try very hard uh, to work against and I would hope that uh, having this data will help us to create a healthcare system that works for everyone um, I also think a lot about the the provincial um, tagline or mandate that we're using which is patients first having this data will allow us to actually put patients first um, and to prioritize access to healthcare for everyone Gotcha. I want to thank all three of you for coming on TVO tonight with a most fascinating discussion. Adam Kassam, Laura Rosella, Sane Dubey, it's great to have you all on board this evening. Good luck and stay healthy out there, you three. Thank you. Steve. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.